I'm grave risk of sticking my head too far above the parapet here, particularly with, with Steve amongst us. But I suppose I would say we are a bit of a success story in Hertfordshire. You've just heard a lot about asset management. Um, we've been doing that for nearly 20 years in our highway service now. Um, we've used data. We've used data to make some powerful arguments for funding. As a result, we've managed to keep our funding levels reasonably consistently adequate, shall we say. That's been a lot of investment from our own local members as well as money from DFT and other sources over, over that period. So over a consistent period of time, we've made a sustained investment. We've seen the quality of our roads improve. So our, our, you know, our, our indicators, however much you like them, however much you think there may be issues with national indicators or scanners, a scanner, and I, you know, I think there's some work to be done on, on all of that. But however you want to measure it, we've seen improvements. We've seen the number of potholes start to drop. Um, the winter's just gone, it was, re was reasonably mild, at least for us. The winter before that, we did a record number of salting outings, so we may not have had buckets of snow, but we sent our gritters out more often than we had in a long time, and I was braced come this time of year. I thought all the bad roads are going to start rolling in, I'm going to be inundated, I'm going to have to cut five million quid out of the resurfacing programme to patch them all up, and the phone didn't ring. Uh, and where we've got to now, and I'm, I'm looking around for some wood to touch, where we've got to now is the state where we have put some resilience back into our network. We've used that long-term asset management investment strategy. We've done a lot of work over the years. We've done a lot more preventative maintenance rather than just fixing up the things that are broken. So we've done a lot of surface treatments to keep our roads in good condition, paired with fixing the roads that have reached the end of their natural life cycle. We've, we've been able to take that long-term investment approach and it is paying off. I, I, won't, I won't say for one moment that our network is fully resilient. Um, I, I won't say for one moment that we, we know where all the drainage is and that that's resilient, but at least in the carriageway perspective, which has probably been the early focus and is probably where a lot of us, at least in the local authority sector, see a lot of the focus to start with, um, that, that I think is a success story. So I think what I would echo is it's worth persevering with. It is an approach. It does rely on, on that long, on, you know, on decent long-term funding. And I know Steve and colleagues have worked very hard. They worked very hard to get us a five-year settlement last time round in the spending review. And, you know, thank you very much genuinely for that. That's really helpful. If we can carry that on in the next spending review and in the future, brilliant. Um, so I'll get off the little bit of a soapbox, but I did want to start by just saying, you know, resilience is there, it is possible. And what I'm going to be talking about now is our resilience strategy in response to, to what we, you know, what, what we and all other local authorities have been quite, quite sensibly required to do. But I, I just wanted to put that out there because I was sitting there listening to, to the last speaker and thinking, well, actually, yeah, we've put resilience back into our network and it's paying off. And sometimes we don't celebrate that. We don't see what we've got. We only see what we haven't got. So um, if you'll forgive that, that slight digression, I'll get on to what I was going to talk about, but I'll probably try and canter through these a little bit quicker if I possibly can. So why, why, is, why is resilience important? Well, um, it, supports, it supports social and, demo, social and economic well-being, and this is a, a big thing. We've made a big play of this to our LEP, uh, our local uh, enterprise partnership, when we're bidding for projects. If we say, well, look, this, this project here will um, we'll, we'll support this key business district. If we don't replace this bridge, then we could lose two million pounds a day in the local economy if something happens to this bridge. That's been a very powerful argument and, and that, that's been quite well, uh, well accepted. Um, and it pro provides access to key facilities and services, you know, hospitals, transport interchanges, key utility sites. And I'm not talking about the cables buried in the ground, but I'm talking about, you know, we've got a, a power station or transfer station or something like that that we need to, we need to maintain access to. And of course, you know, we've got the features in the DFT incentive funding. It's, it's set out in well-maintained highway infrastructure. It supports our local transport plan four because we need to keep people moving around the network. And we've got TMA duties, Traffic Management Act duties as well. Um, all of which says resilience is important. So what, what are the problems? And none of these are going to be particularly f uh, unfamiliar to you. Well, we, we've, we've suffered from snow in the past. You get storm events. Uh, we get flooding events, not not on a on a Cumbria scale because we don't have major rivers, but it can still be uh, still be an issue. This isn't Hertfordshire, as you can probably tell by the vehicles, <laughs> but we we have had this. We we had a few years ago. You talk about asphalt melting. Um, we had an issue like this on a concrete section of the A10 uh, in Hertfordshire, where the 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 
the bar, you know, the, the, the reinforcing bars or the expansion joint bars weren't doing their job. Uh, they, they'd seized up and in a very hot heat wave we had concrete section buckle and I had a, a 45 mil rebar sat on my desk for a, for a while with a 90 degree angle in the middle of it. Um, and so you, you, can, you can get all sorts of fun issues. Uh, and that, that is Hertfordshire. That, that's Fontwell Close in St Albans which made international news when it suddenly decided to develop its own unique pothole. Um, that, was, that was quite fun dealing with that one um, and, the, and the challenges around that. And then there are just the incidents on the network, the road traffic accidents, the, the, all that sort of thing. Uh, anything that messes up our network, and we have a very busy network, Hertfordshire for those of you who don't know, is, is only about 20 miles north of here. Uh, wrapped around the sort of the north side of London, the M25, the M1, uh, the A1M all go through Hertfordshire. We have, yeah, we, we take a lot of, of busy traffic on our network. It doesn't take very much to uh, to actually mess up the network hugely. Um, so what we want to do is make sure we minimise the disruption, and that includes basic, you know, normal standard road works. See, we're doing some road works that isn't our network. Um, but um, if, if, you're, if you know, we're just putting roadworks, every time we put a cone on the network, something happens and that, you know, that it slows down somebody. So the number of times that we, we interrupt the network with planned works, the, the more we can reduce that, the more we can plan that out, the, the better. Um, so what can we do about this? So th those, those are our strategic goals and I'll, you, you'll all have the slide pack, so I won't, I won't go through everything in any great in any great detail but that's what we're looking to do and that's that's what our resilient strategy is aiming for that is our, our resilient highway network and i'm going to disappoint steve um, and tell him that at the moment it is our what we call our reduced salting network so that's the network that we salt if um if we're running out of salt and we haven't had to use that for quite a while but it's sat there and that's our sort of our, our tippy top priority roads if you like and that if you like there was a little bit of where well, we were all working together, but the, the, the network people, the resi our network management folks, really wanted the salting network to be, to be king. Uh, and we said, OK, we'll, we'll do that for now. But what we're working on is actually we're, we're reviewing our whole um, highway in, um, hierarchy um, because we haven't done that for a while and we think it was due it anyway. And what I want to do is to get us to a resilient hierarchy where our hierarchy reflects actually these are the roads, these are the points in the network, and we may end up with some points at the very top of the network, and I'll come on to some of those in a moment. These are the ones where we need the most resilience. If this falls over, if we lose this key junction, then half of Hertfordshire grinds to a halt. If we, then, 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 so I'm, I'm looking at it on a tier basis, on a hierarchical basis. So we want some resilience in our whole network. Fontmell Close wasn't very resilient, but despite the fact that it's a close, we did actually manage, that's the one with the sinkhole, we did actually manage to build a, 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 a temporary access road to keep all the residents who had to live without their road for the best part of a year, to give them some kind of access to their close. So you can build resilience in even the most unusual situations, but we wouldn't need that. We wouldn't want to build, we wouldn't want to have a temporary access road available for every cul-de-sac in Hertfordshire just in case we needed it, but we might want to think about something like that for our really key points on the network. So that's sort of how we respond to unplanned events. We, we have a, quite a good uh, integrated transport control centre with screens covering one wall that, uh, that has lots of data on it, lots of information, coordinates a lot of stuff. We've got the usual protocols. Uh, we know how we're going to respond to the things that we know about. Uh, and we're fairly good at being able to respond flexibly to the things that we don't know about. Um, and I, I say, we've got a few, I, I've thrown in a few of the development ideas. What I'm trying to do is to tell you what we're doing and what we're thinking about doing in the future. And I'll, I'll you know, I'm happy to take any questions, but I'm not going to go through everything line by line. Um, so how do we plan and coordinate works on the network? The usual suite. Uh, we are a permitting authority, so our, 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 our permitting regime is quite, is quite rigorous. Um, we do a lot of licensing, we have a network management plan, we have a winter service plan, uh, also we have all sorts of things. Um, one of the things we're looking at for, the, for these sort of these really key network nodes that I was talking about is a sort of the workathon approach where we think, right, this is a key junction, we're going to go in, we're going to hit it hard, we're going to do everything that needs doing, uh, we're going to do a load of things that probably don't need doing yet, and we might even do some things that will just are just there to build some extra extra resilience in, and then we'll be able to walk away and we'll be able to leave this and not touch it even even on a routine basis for five, ten years, hopefully. Going in with going in with the first well, with the example of this, this is Burry Grove Interchange. This is uh, this is the M1. 
the A41 and the A4008. And as you can see from the numbers there, those are some roads that carry an awful lot of traffic. The, M the M1 is Highways England. Um, the A41 and the A4008 are Hertfordshire County Council roads, as is the roundabout that, that connects the three. Um, so we know that this is one of, those, one of those junctions on our network where if we lose this, um, we're in some serious trouble. And we, in part we know that because we've got a, a county-wide traffic model and we've used that county-wide traffic model, which is called Comet. You probably can't see, but this is the, th that's the Berry Grove interchange there with the, those three main roads coming off it. The, the A4008 links down into the, the sort of the centre of Watford, so that is the main route now into central Watford for most traffic coming in um, from outside the area. Um, a, slightly, uh, a slightly interesting aside, we've just done a major uh, refurbishment in Watford Town Centre. Watford again, major town just on the outskirts of London, as you can see probably just inside the M25. The M25 runs around there. And one of the things that we've built, we built into that in partnership with the local borough council and with the Hertfordshire Police was some, uh, some hopefully unnoticeable security resilience. So the scheme was designed with um, security bollards that are rather deeper in the ground than they might appear and all of that sort of thing because it was, it was decided on police advice that Watford was a potential site for the kind of um, terror threat that we've seen in recent years with somebody just deciding they're going to hire a vehicle, they're going to hire a van or something, and they're going to try and drive it through a crowded area. Um, so Watford Town Centre, just, just down there in the picture, was, was designed with that. So we're starting to build some of these resilience things in. We took that particular opportunity. But what you can see, what the model is telling us here, if we close the Berry Grove interchange, then the blue roads will have less traffic on them. So those three main arteries have less traffic on them. All of these local roads in the area start to pick up the slack, as do the M25 out there, uh, the M40, A40 corridor through there, and several other key roads. And, and obviously that corridor there is outside Hertfordshire, but we're still, we're thinking, we have to think with that kind of width and that kind of breadth. So we've, we've obviously identified that that's a, a, a key priority for us. So we've been working with um, other stakeholders and what we're planning to do in a year or two's time is to go in, do the resurfacing but do the barriers, upgrade the drainage, make sure the bridges are all sorted, that the decks are fine, that the waterproofing is good, so that hopefully with all the signals interchange and the signals upgrade as well, we'll try and do all of that as one big package so that we can walk away from that junction knowing that not only will it, should it not need anything in, over the next few years, but we've also built in as much resilience as we can so we don't get that kind of nightmare scenario where we lose Berry Grove Interchange and suddenly that quarter of Hertfordshire and northwest London grinds to a bit of a halt. So we've been using asset management principles to, to, to plan and deliver, um, as I mentioned, and that's a sort of a fairly key part of the approach. Um, we've, we've ha we have a pavement management strategy and we've been using data and doing modelling to predict our uh, our needs and to plan our, our carriageway maintenance programs for quite a while now. Um, we're working on a sort of a proactive tree management strategy, uh, which is starting to uh, bear dividends. I need to bear fruit there, which was there. We don't actually have fruit trees, although, you know, who knows, maybe that's it. Maybe that's the growth area. Maybe I plant apple trees along the sides of the roads and we, we sell a cash crop somehow. Looking to improve our existing assets. So we're looking at decluttering now as what we call one and done. As part of a maintenance scheme or an improvement scheme, we go in, we have a look, we say, do we actually need all these signposts? Can we take them out? Just sort of basic uh, manual for streets type work, but trying to build it in as a, uh, you know, as a core part of what we do. Um, what we're looking for in the future? Well, we, we have a lot of dual carriageways, a lot of extra urban dual carriageways, um, and they all have grass down the middle and we have to cut that grass, and we cut it about six times a year, so that's six lots of traffic management we have to put on our main A roads that we wouldn't otherwise have to do. Um, now, it doesn't look particularly beautiful, but if we harden the central reserve, if we get rid of those tension barriers, which again are another thing that we have to, they get hit, we, we put out some cones, then we have to go back and we have to barrier it off again and go and replace them. It does, some, does something like this, and this is something we're thinking about. This is, again, shot from a motorway, so not something we, we've done as yet. But if we do that, does that, take a, does that add resilience? Does that take out the need to regularly close a road or close a lane to cut grass? Uh, does it take out the need to reactively close a road or a lane in order to repair a barrier on a, on a, a regular but unpredictable basis? Are there other ways? Can we, you know, can, can we perhaps... You know, we don't want to lose the drainage area. Is there something that doesn't need cutting but is, um, 
is permeable. Can we put artificial grass on so it still looks nice? <laughs> How does that affect biodiversity? Because well, the one thing we don't want to do is throw the baby out with the bathwater. So this is probably why we haven't leapt in and done anything like this yet. But it's one of the things we're thinking. How can we, how can we build... How can we design, how can we retrofit works so that our roads don't need quite as much uh, regular interference in the future? Because, as I say, every time we put a cone on, it, it does cause some disruption. Um, bigger gullies. And it, sounds, it, sound, it, sounds like, it sounds like I've been listening to our elected members, who are all wonderful people and might be watching this on YouTube later, so I need to be very careful what I say. Um, but people always say, oh, just put a bigger gully in. That's the solution to all your drainage problems. Well, as we all know, it isn't. But actually, in certain specific areas, if the problem is that the gullies fill up quickly and therefore we have, to, we have to empty our gullies more often, that's another interference on the network. So maybe we have vulnerable gullies that we clean on a more regular basis and normal gullies that we clean on a less regular basis. If we make the gully pots bigger or put in more gully pots, we collect the silt, uh, we don't have to empty those gullies on such a regular basis. So we make the, the network a little bit more resilient. And it's less likely that those gullies will be full during that flash flood event that we can't necessarily predict. So again, our network is less likely to flood. So perhaps sometimes, and again, maybe with our Berry Grove example, we do want to go in and we do want to over-engineer things like the drainage just so that it can cope with rather than maybe the, 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 one in, the one in two year event that it was probably designed for way back in the day, if it was designed at all, maybe upgrade it so that it can cope with that one in a hundred event rather more, rather more easily. And then of course there's, there's, there's knowing what drainage inventory we've got. That lovely country path on the side there, when we, turned, when we, when we dug it out, actually turned out to be a drainage asset, who'd have thunk it? Um, so, so probably 20 years of nobody even knowing it was there. It was a lot more overgrown, that picture doesn't really do it justice, it was a lot more overgrown before we cleared it. But yeah, we, we discovered actually in doing some work on a nearby viaduct, um, that this was a whole drainage asset here and then we've cleared it out and we put it back into use and we put it on the inventory. Um, so there's probably quite a lot of work that we still need to do. I know there's a lot of work that we still need to do to gather a better drainage inventory. Um, and what, obviously what we're going to be doing, what we are doing, is focusing on the areas that we've identified as key resilience nodes, shall we say. Uh, and this, as I say, this is, this is right next to one of them. This is immediately adjacent um, to the Wadesmill viaduct on the, on the A10, which is a very long viaduct. And again, if something happened to it, uh, would, would put a really big chunk of our network out of operation. Um, so we're, we're focusing our efforts, at least initially, on making sure that we know where the key infrastructure is related to resilience. Uh, we use VMS signs, we have quite a few on the network and we're, we're doing a review of those, their locations. But not everything is big bits of kit, not everything is um, you know, ma massive million pound jobs on, on motorway junctions. Um, a, couple of, uh, yeah, a couple of examples following now, and, and you mentioned road markings, somebody mentioned road markings. This is, this is the sort of the how to do it and how not to do it, although in the other way around. So first, first junction, this is um, on the A414 at London Colney. So this is where a, a spur off the M25 crosses the A414, which is a main uh, east-west route in the county and goes to the, the town of St Albans. Um, this is a very busy junction and it has a bit of an accident history because people don't stay in the right lane. Um, and as you can probably see, the road markings there back in 2011 were, really weren't doing their job of helping people. And so we refreshed them and in 2012 uh, they all look lovely. And then by 2016 again they're all a bit worn out, fairly predictably. Unfortunately given the amount of traffic on that roundabout. Um, so skipping to Hemel Hempstead, uh, another bit of the A414, the western end of it, right down by the A41 if anybody knows that. This is the Plough Roundabout, better known locally as the Magic Roundabout. It's uh, a big roundabout made up of six mini roundabouts. So it has a lot of traffic, it's very confusing. I see some people laughing, you obviously know it, yeah. Uh, my mother, when she drove, she, she, she stopped driving a few years ago, but she would never go near there. She didn't do motorways and she didn't do the magic roundabout, bless her. And that was, she was probably very wise. She'd take a long detour to avoid it. Um, but yes, it, it's, it's, it can be very confusing. And again, road markings are therefore important both for safety and for keeping the flow of traffic moving. So we did the play around about 2008. It looked a bit, it looked a bit uh, manky. 2009, similarly. There we go, 2012, we resurfaced it and we put lovely new road markings back. And in 2014, they looked like that. And in 2017, they still look like that. And they still look like that now because we used a different sort of road marking. Uh, we used a higher 
spec road marking, I'm not going to plug individual products, but we had to think about it and we thought it's worth it. This roundabout, the, the cost of putting the TM on, the difficulty of closing it just to repeat <coughs> road markings, we're going to invest, we're going to make it more resilient. And that's something we're now rolling out as a matter of course on resurfacing jobs on our main A roads. So road markings that last longer um, and don't need to be refreshed, both for the, their safety and resilience implications and because we then don't have to put traffic management on to refresh road markings. So there are some other things we're, we're, we're thinking about. Um, I, which again, I won't go through the detail. We're trying to ensure that new infrastructure is designed to be as resilient and have some of these things built in. And that's, um, that's all to the good. Uh, anybody wants any, any information, you will have the slide back and you feel free to talk to me afterwards. As I mentioned, uh, we've been doing a little bit of talking to other people and doing some, some sort of, if you like, online snooping and seeing what other people are doing. Picked out a couple of examples. Transport for the West Midlands and their, their role very much more as a strategic transport authority. Gives them a slightly different emphasis. And some of what they're talking about is using information to allow people to, to, to re-time and re-mode, not just reroute. We're, we're rerouting people with our VMS signs, you know, A1M closed, use a different route. Um, what they're trying to do is to get people to re-time and re-mode, and that's very much what I think we're, we've all been talking about today, very much the future of intelligent transport. Can I decide to take a different mode of transport? Is my journey necessary? Can it wait till this afternoon? Um, some interesting thoughts there. Um, and we've also been um, sharing some work with, with, with Wokingham. We, they, they, like us, uh, both have a, a relationship, a contract relationship with WSP. And one of the guys in my team spent some of his time down at Wokingham. So I asked him to, to, to tell us a little bit about what they were doing. And again, you can see a similar sort of thing to what we're doing. They're pulling together a plan. They're thinking about things and they're, they're trying to focus on how they can how they can make their network a little bit more resilient within the, the resources and the constraints that they've got. 